When you hear the word serpent, you might think of a snake. But serpents in biochemistry, this is a serine protease inhibitor. So serine proteases are a type of enzyme or reaction helper that what they do is they actually cut or chew proteins. And so this has use in, say, your digestive tract to digest the foods you eat. It also has use in doing things like helping make these like clotting cascades. But you, there's a time and there's a place. So serine proteases in the body have these natural inhibitors called serpins. And in the lab, we can use unnatural inhibitors, things like PMSF. And these types of inhibitors are able to permanently inhibit these serine proteases in this permanent way because the serine protease uses this really cool mechanism. It's called this like catalytic triad because it uses three amino acids. So it has the serine, which is the one that's actually like gives the protease its name and its blades, as we'll see. But in order to get activated, that serine needs the help of a histidine, and in order to get activated, the histidine needs help of the aspartate. And in order to make it so that you're only cutting specific things, you have a specific site in this enzyme where when they substrate, so when the thing that's going to get acted on, when the thing that's gonna get cut, if it's the right shape, it can then fit in this pocket and it kind of puts every, all those three amino acids right into place in order to have this activation occur so that you get the peptide B cut. And in the case of the inhibitors, what happens is that the inhibitor tricks the, trips the enzyme into thinking that it's a substrate and then it gets stuck on. And it gets stuck on because what's really cool about serine proteases as well as some other types of proteases like cysteine and threonine proteases is it does it in this like two-part mechanism. Um, so basically you have the peptide and like first of all this, the protease attacks and then half of it gets stuck on and then the protease had like half of its release but you still have like one half of the peptide on there and now what's going to happen is that the protease actually activates water and that water is going to come in and attack and kick off the second half so that you've regenerated the enzyme but if you have one of these like covalent inhibitors then what's going to happen is it's going to get permanently stuck on and so this is really useful for us in the lab if we want to keep these proteases from like chewing up our proteins when we're purifying them. But it's also really useful in the body to prevent proteases from chewing up what you don't want them chewing in the body. Um, and so for example, this is where the serpents come in. For example, if you have some sort of like inflammation, you're gonna wanna get your like blood cells there to kind of help clot and do all sorts of stuff to heal it. But there's a bunch of connective tissue in the way. Um, and so all of this tissue is making it hard for those blood cells and those immune cells that need to get to that area to fix it to actually get there. And so you can use a protease like elastase to chew that up. Problem is you don't want to be chewing up like everything else. And so other cells can, you can have the neutrophils, which are one of these types of immune cells, kind of like make this elastase. And then these other cells can make this alpha-1 antitrypsin. And what this does is it kind of acts as a moat. And so it's going to surround the, the region so that, that the activity of the elastase is going to be contained where you want it. So you can kind of like make this path to the, to the wound or to the infected site or the inflamed site um, without chewing up everything around it. Um, similarly, we have things like antiplasmin and um, antithrombin that can then basically pro modulate or kind of like help control the plot, the clotting and the unclotting and all of these various things. So this is one way that our body contains, um, can like control these proteases. Another way is by making them as inactive precursors that then get activated by having a part cleaved off by another protease and then they kind of get like these cascades. So we'll talk about this various stuff um, as well as get really, really nitty gritty into that mechanism because it's a really, really core mechanism, this conserved catalytic triad. And it's just like a beautiful example of amino acids working together. And it goes over a lot of the concepts. It's like a good review of the concepts we've been talking about. Um, things like we're gonna see serine act as a nucleophile. We're gonna see histidine act as a base. We're gonna see aspartate um, show its acidic um, power off um, by being negatively charged and helping kind of um, make histidine more basic, which is going to make serine more nucleophilic and so we're going to talk about all these different concepts as well as see how these different amino acids how because you have these specific properties of these specific amino acids in the context of this like beautifully designed protein 
you get this awesome result. Um, and so there's a lot of different um, serine proteases. These include like chemotrypsin, trypsin, and elastase, um, various things. And they're really, really cool. And so I just want to talk about them. So let's just start by making sure we're all on the same page and sort of in terms of the terminology. So we're going to be talking about amino acids as part of proteins and peptides. So a peptide is basically just like kind of like a short chain of amino acids. And then a protein is like a longer chain of amino acids that folds up to make a functional protein. And it's going to fold up in that way, um, dependent on its primary sequence. So basically the the order of the amino acids. What amino acids does it have? How many? What order? This is all going to influence how the protein folds and how the protein functions. Um, and so, but when you link them together through these peptide bonds, you get peptides. Um, and so sometimes you'll see like peptidase, like serine peptidase. Um, sometimes the terms peptidase and protease are kind of used interchangeably, um, but peptid, peptides we typically think of as being shorter things and proteins would be like a longer folded up thing, but it's sometimes the terminology is kind of like interchanged. Speaking of terminology being interchanged, when these amino acids are free floating, we call them amino acids. When they link together, we technically call them residues because you no longer have an amino acid. Um, once you've linked together these um, individual amino acids, you do so using the amino group and the carboxylic acid group. And so what you're left with is no longer an amino acid. Instead, you're left with like the residuals, um, the residues from, from those amino acids. But we often just talk about them as being amino acids. We would talk about like serine, we could say like the serine residue in the protein, um, but we might also just like slip up and say the amino acid. So I might use those terms interchangeably. Speaking of namings, yeah, I just mentioned like the protease, peptidase thing. We can also further classify these. So an endoprotease is going to cut in the middle of the peptide or the protein. And an exoprotease is going to cut from an end. So that's one way we can classify them. We can also classify them based on like how they cut. So some of them, like we, we're going to see today, and when I just mentioned, we, these like serine proteases, these cysteine proteases, these threonine proteases, these are kind of like the blades are going to come from the from the proteases active site, so where things are happening. It's actually going to be the protease that's going to be attacking rather than, say, like water attacking, at least for that initial attack, when we're actually attacking the peptide and getting in the first attack, we're going to get stuck onto the protein because your scissors are going to get stuck on one of the halves. Um, and so this is going to be a covalent intermediate. So where a covalent bond is one of these like strong bonds. Um, but we'll see, we can break a covalent bond, but it's not just like, it's, it's not just attracted there. It's actually like sharing electrons and stuff. And we'll get way more into this. But you have it so that part of it is going to be stuck on initially. Um, and then we're going to kick that second part off. So it's like two-step type of thing. Other times what's going to happen is that instead of having it get stuck on the enzyme, these proteases are going to make water do the work for them. So they're going to turn water into scissors in the very beginning. Um, and so there's going to be like a single step and no intermediate because, well, nothing's going to get stuck on because the enzyme isn't directly attacking the substrate. Um, and so it's classified by like what eggs that water on. So um, the water has to kind of get activated by removing a proton and making it a better nucleophile. And we'll talk more about this too, because we're going to have to remove a proton from serine in order to activate it, make it want to attack. Um, and so some of the proteases that do this, do that water activation are like aspartic proteases and glutamic proteases and metalloproteases. Um, and so we'll, I'll br briefly mention these when we get into talking about some of the inhibitors, um, but just know that not all of the proteases are going to use a similar mechanism like this. And this is going to make these in some cases so that we like harder to inhibit in a way because we can't like get something permanently stuck on them. So we have to keep like adding inhibitor um, because the inhibitors just kind of have to compete with the, with the actual substrates. Whereas if you have some sort of like irreversible covalent inhibitor, well, now it's going to like permanently get stuck on your enzyme and cause problems for the enzyme. Um, but maybe not problems for you in the lab if you're using it because you want to use it um, using an enzyme inhibitor like PNSF in order to permanently deactivate those proteases that are out there to get your protein. Sometimes in the lab, though, proteases come in really useful. Um, and so another way we can think about the like classifying proteases is some of them are really generic, um, whereas some of them are more specific. 
So some of these proteases are pretty generic. Um, so you wouldn't want a protease that's just like totally generic because then it would just chew up anything. Um, but in the case of like in your digestive system and that sort of thing, then genericness is pretty good. Um, they're not totally generic because, well, an enzyme's active site, like where stuff is happening, it can't just like hold anything. It has to kind of like, it'll have like a sort of preference based on the shape of the active site. Like if something is charged in there, not charged in there, if it's big, if it's little. And so you get different specificities, even for the more generic proteases. And so like a trypsin, it's going to cut next to a lysine or an arginine. And this is, these, you can see these are positively charged. And so trypsin is going to have like a negatively charged residue in there that makes it attractive for these. Um, chemotrypsin, you're going to see that it's, it has cuts next to big bulky things because it's got a big pocket that can accommodate those nicely. Um, and elastase, it's going to cut next to smaller things. It's got a smaller pocket um, and things like that. And so you get some sort of specificity, but these are still pretty generic. So in the case of the generic ones, um, things like trypsin, well, that can come in really handy if you just want to like digest pep proteases and I mean, you just want to like digest proteins for like mass spectrometry. So basically you want to cut this protein up into little pieces and then measure those pieces to try to figure out um, what, what the protein, what proteins are in the, some sort of mixture or what modifications maybe that protein has. Um, you need to cut it up first. And so when you, you want something more generic, and so these more generic ones would be good for that. Sometimes we want to use really specific proteases. And so really specific proteases are going to recognize like specific sequences and cut them. Um, and this can be really helpful if you want to say like tag your protein with like an affinity tag. So basically a little tag you can put onto your protein, something like a his tag or something like that. I talk about more in other posts, but you want a way that you can then cut it off later. Um, and so these site-specific proteases are really helpful for that. Um, so things like thrombin, and that's also really good for in your body because you want to make sure that you're not like activating, like thrombin isn't activating things that you don't want it to activate or cutting up things that you don't want it to cut up. Um, and so the sequence, more sequence specific ones are really helpful for that. Whereas these more generic ones are really helpful for like digesting things either in your body or in the case of like digesting your sample for mass spec. So now let's talk more about these serine proteases because and their mechanism, because this mechanism is just super duper cool. Um, and so as I mentioned, it's going to involve a serine, a histidine and an aspartate. And we call this like a catalytic triad. Some other important parts of this enzyme that we're going to see. So again, this is kind of like showing you a mock like active site. So the active site is where things are going to happen. In this active site, there's multiple parts. Um, and so you have these residues sticking out. So remember the residue is kind of like the leftovers of those amino acids once they join together. Um, and basically, if you think about what an enzyme does, so an enzyme is going to be a reaction speeder upper and it's going to speed up or catalyze reactions without getting used up in the process. So it's going to be able to do things again and again and again. So in this active site, we need to set up a environment where this reaction is going to like be promoted, that this reaction can occur. Um, so enzymes often to like bring things together in the right orientation, hold things in place, um, stabilize intermediates. And we're going to see all of these various things. So the enzyme's active site has to kind of be configured so that it can promote this interaction, get these hold these molecules in place to react, stabilize their intermediates, um, and make sure that you are, well, binding to the right thing. And so when it comes to binding to the right thing, making the right things react, um, these enzymes have a specificity pocket. And the specificity pocket is really cool because it's going to not only determine the, the specificity, as we saw in the case of having like different active site um, shapes and charges in this, like the, the trypsin and the chemotrypsin and that sort of thing. Also, what's going to happen is that binding to the, when something that matches binds, it's actually going to help organize the active site, organize these catalytic residues. So the catalytic residues, the thing that's actually going to be like doing the catalysis, doing the reaction, um, it's going to basically need to get pushed into place so that this enzyme isn't going to be cutting up anything, um, like everything. And so to give the, spe the specificity is going to connect to actually activating the enzyme, which is really cool.
Another place on the active site we're going to look at is this oxy anion hole. Um, so an anion is a negatively charged thing. And we're going to see that we have this really awkward, like negatively charged intermediate um, that's got like too many things attached and it's just weird. And so basically that weird intermediate can break a couple different ways. And to make sure that it breaks the right way, you need to stabilize the part that you want to keep together. And so the oxy anion hole is going to help with this kind of like hold on to that part that we don't want, um, we don't want to get split up. Um, and so that the other part is going to get kicked off. And we'll talk more about this. Um, but yeah, so we're going to see this two-part mechanism where we're going to have the protease attack the substrate, um, get stuck on the part of the substrate, and then have to have water come and free the other part. Um, and then again, when you have a covalent, in, because you have this covalent intermediate where the enzyme is stuck on there, if you have a covalent inhibitor, you can get this inhibitor permanently stuck on there if this inhibitor has something that's not as easy to kick off as the other half of a peptide. Okay, so this is going to be the overall mechanism, and then we are going to go more in detail about like why it's happening in this way, um, but this is just an overview. But don't worry if some of these terms don't make, more, make sense. I'm going to go into them in more detail. So as I mentioned, when that substrate binds into the substrate binding site, it's going to, if it map, if you if you have like a match, it, it fits that site nicely. Well, now what's going to happen is those that that triad is going to kind of like merge into shape. Um, and it's going to merge into shape in order to what it needs to do first is it needs to activate the serine. And so serine in this protonated state, it's not very attacky. So what's going to happen is we need to deprotonate it. We need to make it more tacky, more nucleophilic. Um, and so how it's going to do this is this histidine is actually going to deprotonate that serine, pull off a proton, proton and make this serine electrophilic, uh, nucleophilic, so that it can attack the peptide. Now, histidine, in order to make it want to attack the serine, we kind of need to pull some proton pull another proton kind of like partway away from the histidine. So this aspartate, it has this negative charge. It's going to kind of attract this pos partly positively charged proton. So you're kind of pulling some of the positivity away from this histidine. And so it's going to be more nucleophilic. It's going to have more electrons and make it want to then get another proton to kind of replace the one that's kind of getting, um, that's kind of affection is being stolen by this aspartate in this hydrogen bond. So what's going to happen is that that's going to activate the histidine, which is going to then come and take off the proton, activate the serine. So now what you have is you have the serine here. You have this hydroxylate group that is now very nucleophilic. And we'll talk much more about this later. Um, but know that nucleophiles attack electrophiles to form new bonds. And this is a nucleophile. This is an electrophile. So you get an attack. And we're going to get an attack at this carbonyl carbon, so the C double bonded to an O. Um, this carbon is going to be, for reasons we'll talk about, it's going to be partly positive. This is negative. Um, everything's coming together for this to want to attack this. And when it attacks this, well, now you get this really awkward intermediate. And this is what I was talking about before, where we need that oxy anion hole to help us. And so oxy, oxygen, anion negatively charged. So we have this negatively charged oxygen here. And so in order to stabilize this intermediate, we have this oxy anion hole. And this is going to help stabilize this intermediate so that this part stays stuck on the enzyme and this part comes off and you don't get things going like backwards um, because enzymes are just kind of like helping the reaction go. They're not they can't make it go one way or another. The reaction is going can go either way. And so the enzyme is actually speeding up both directions. Um, but we can make one direction more favorable. And this is helping making the direction you want be more favorable. Um, and so what happens is that you're making it so that now you've stabilized this part. And what can happen is you can kick off the other part. And how would this this part is going to get kicked off is basically this nitrogen here. So this intermediate is so awkward because you have like these four things down to carbon, which carbon binds to four things all the time, um, but not usually to like two oxygens where one of them is negatively charged. And yeah, it's just really awkward. And this is going to be a really vulnerable bond because these oxygens and these nitrogens are going to be kind of pulling electrons away from this carbon. And this is basically just ready to split. But it's not really a good leaving group as it is. And so this nitrogen is going to pick off that proton that that histidine had stolen before. And it's going to take that proton and it's going to take it with it. 
Um, and this makes it happy on its own. And so it's going to leave. But now you still have half of this peptide covalently attached. And so we need to kick that off. And how we're going to kick that off is actually we're going to recruit some water. And so what's going to happen is that this histidine is going to kind of steal a proton from water, activate that water. And now that water can do the same sort of thing. And so this is going to attack this carbonyl carbon. I know poor guy keeps getting attacked, but this is going to give us another one of those awkward tetrahedral intermediates. And this time we're going to resolve it in a way that's going to break off, break this off of the enzyme. And so basically what's going to happen is that these electrons on that negatively charged oxygen are actually going to flow back. They're going to push off this group, which is going to steal a proton. Um, and so then everything is happy. And everything is set back to that original condition. And so this protease can then do it again and again and again. Um, so let us talk more about these different details. So let's actually start like way back in the beginning, just so we make sure that we're on the same term with some of these terms. So, and I can use them without being like, oh man, I just used some jargon that they might not know. Um, which I probably still will just do accidentally, but I'm trying. Um, but I'm guessing that if you are really interested in this stuff, if you're still watching, you probably have some have a lot of this background. But just in case there's some parts that are missing, let's just go from the beginning. Um, so basically, all these carbons, oxygens, nitrogens, these are representing atoms of different elements. Um, these atoms are made up of smaller parts, subatomic particles. We've got the protons, the neutrons, and the electrons. In the the number of protons is what defines the atom, the, like the, which element it is. Um, but the number of neutrons and the number of electrons can vary. And what we're typically thinking about isn't so much the neutrons. We can care about those if we're thinking about like radioactivity and stuff. But in the case, um, most cases, we're just thinking about the protons and the electrons. Now, these are equal and oppositely charged. So if you have an equal number of protons and electrons, you have a neutral molecule. If you have an uneven number of protons and electrons, you have an ion or a charged particle. Um, and basically, the electrons, the protons are held in this dense central core along with those neutrons, and then the electrons are whizzing around it. And different atoms have different, like, ideal numbers of electrons that they want um, and different, like, amounts that they like electrons. And they can kind of share electrons in order to get the number that they want. So they can like give and share in electrons. And when they share electrons, what they're kind of doing is like overlapping parts of their electron clouds. So those places where those electrons are all whizzing around. And when they do this, we say that they form a covalent bond. So a single pair of electrons shared forms a single bond and you share two pairs and you have a double bond. Um, and then you can also have lone pairs where these are unpaired electrons. But atoms can do all this and form these strong like covalent bonds. Um, and then you can also get like charge charge interactions and you can get partial charge partial charge interactions, which is a super, super duper big thing in biochemistry when we're talking thinking about polarity. So when those atoms are overlapping their clouds, when they're sharing electrons, those electrons aren't necessarily like equally shared. And so in the case of water, you have two hydrogen shared with an oxygen, but the oxygen is going to be hogging the electrons that they share. And so if you look, think about those merged clouds, those electrons are going to be hanging out more near the oxygen, but those protons are stuck in place. And so basically the charge is going to, you'll have some regions of a molecule that are going to be negatively charged in this case, the around the oxygen. And then those other parts are going to be partly positively charged um, around those hydrogens. And so we get this separation of charge we call polarity. Um, and so different atoms are going to have different amounts of like pulling this different hog amounts that they hog those electrons. And so oxygen and nitrogen are going to hog them really well. And we call these hoggers electronegative. And so we're going to see that oxygen is and nitrogen are going to be electronegative. And this is going to make it so that they have more electrons hanging out with them. And sometimes they get more electrons hanging out with them than they actually want. Um, and so then they become nucleophilic. Um, and so a nucleophile is something that has extra electrons or an extra share of that electron density. Um, sometimes they're negatively charged, but not always. As we'll see, this negative charge can increase their, um, their nucleophilicity, um, which is referring to like whether or not they want to attack an electrophile. Um, and so a nucleophile they love nuclei. They love where the positivity is. Those positively charged protons are located in the nuclei, and so they're attracted to nuclei.
Um, and specifically, they're attracted to the nuclei of an electrophile, which is something that um, doesn't that wants more electrons. Um, and so they're like a match made in heaven. And what happens is that a nucleophile can attack an electrophile to either form a new bond um, or to like, in the case of, we say like once the thing acts as a base, it can like steal a proton. Protons are kind of like a dead end. So if you steal a proton, it's kind of like, that's the end of the line. Um, but if you attack another sort of bond, you, this is, we typically refer to this as acting as a nucleophile rather than like in this case, even though it is a nucleophile, it's like a specific case when it acts as a base. We're not really going to be talking too much about that. Um, I guess maybe a little. Um, but in the case of our serine attack, we're going to be acting as like a nucleophile. And basically we attack an electrophile and um, typically then something else has to get kicked off. Um, and this kicking off can happen in a couple of different ways. And what we're going to be looking at in this case is going to be like an SN2 reaction where basically you have one thing attacked and then you get that awkward tetrahedral intermediate. So tetrahedral, four things attached, um, and then something gets kicked off. And that thing that gets kicked off is the leaving group. And we're going to see that you want to have a good leaving group um, in order to have this reaction go the way that you want. And so some of the parts of the enzyme is going to be doing, like with that oxyanion hole, is helping make it so that the part that you want to stay is not a good leaving group, and the part that you want to leave is a good leaving group. Um, and so that's one of the ways that enzymes can help out. But if a reaction, if the leaving group isn't good, then the reaction isn't going to happen. Um, and so this is why we have to like, activate things and do two parts and all this various stuff is in order to make it so that the part that you want to leave actually leaves. So serine is going to be able to serve as a really, really, really good nucleophile. Um, and it's going to do this because it's going to be really, really unhappy. And we're going to have to make it really unhappy though. So in just in its protonated state, it's not going to be that much of a nucleophile because it's, it's happy with that, with having that hydrogen there. And if it forms another bond, then it have to like kick off that hydrogen and the hydrogen is not going to be a good leaving group. But if you make it so that you have, you lose that hydrogen, well, now you're going to have a, um, you're going to have it so that that oxygen is going to be negatively charged. That negative charge, you have this tight concentration of negative charge that's going to make it so that it's really going to want, um, it's going to really want something to help it with all that charge. And so it's going to be a stronger nucleophile. Um, and it's actually a really strong base too. And so it's this way because it really wants that. It really does not like being deprotonated. Unlike an aspartic, unlike our aspartic acid, which we'll see, it aspartic acid is normally in its aspartate state. Um, so it's deprotonated state um, because you're going to have it so that when it's deprotonated, you get this carboxylate group, which this has resonance stabilization. So basically these electrons are going to be shared um, through um, among the multiple molecules, among multiple atoms, rather than just among the two of them. Um, and so this is going to help stabilize that charge. We're spreading out that charge. We're making things really happy. This is going to be happy as is. And so you'll see that aspartate is almost always going to be in this negatively charged state. But serine, instead of having a carboxylic acid group, it has an alcohol group. And when this alcohol group deprotonates, you get the hydroxylate. And this is the group that we're talking about as being really, really nucleophilic because it's really, really desperate to have some help with that with all that electron density. But it's going, so it's going to, because it really realizes that help and it sees like in water, there's going to be all these protons around and it's going to be protonated. Um, and so it's going to act as a base um, and take one of those protons. Our goal here is to kind of activate it to act as a nucleophile rather than like as a base. So we don't want it to just steal a proton. We want it to actually attack our peptide. And so we're going to have to do this in this really controlled manner where we do things really, really quickly. We keep water out of there and we um, make it so that we can pull off that proton. And we're going to be pulling it off by that histidine right in time to attack the peptide. So remember, you're not getting things like move into place for this activation until you have the substrate that matches like bind into that subspecificity pocket. So that's going to bring everything together, allow that serine to get deprotonated. Um, and when you deprotonate that serine, well, now you've got a really, really strong nucleophile. Um, and what's going to happen is so like serine, we don't even think about it really as one of these like ionizable amino acids. So remember an ion is a charge. And so typically when we think about like ionizable amino acids, we're thinking of like your typical like acidic and basic amino acids. 
Um, and so things like aspartic acid and glutamic acid and lysine and arginine and histidine, these are the things that we normally think about as being ionizable, as being able to like give and take protons, um, which is going to make them positive or negatively charged, depending on whether they're talking about acidic or talking about basic. But in any case, we, serine, we don't even usually think about in those terms um, because serine is almost always going to be protonated, but we can de we can deprotonate it. And that's the key thing. And so we see that um, we have this pKa of about 13. And so the pKa refers to the pH at which half of it is going to be um, negatively charged, half of it is going to be protonated and half of it is going to be deprotonated. So pH is basically a measure of how many free protons are around. And if you have more free protons around, you're going to have a lower pH and be more acidic. It's because it's, it's like inverse log scale. So more protons, more acidic, um, but lower pH. If you have fewer protons, then you're going to be more basic or more alkaline, and you're going to have a higher pH. And the value of the pKa is going to be the pH at which half of your thing is going to be in either form. So you can think about if there's a lot of protons around, it's more likely to be deprotonated. If there's not that many protons around, it's more likely to be deprotonated. And so, but whether or not it's protonated or deprotonated doesn't just depend on how many protons are around. It also depends on how much the thing wants the proton. And so in the case of our hydroxyl group, that oxygen really wants that proton. And so we have this really, really high pKa. We have a pKa of about 13. What this tells us is that we would have to get above a pH of 13 for there not to be enough electrons around, for not to be enough protons around for it to prefer to be in this deprotonated state. And in our bodies, we have a pH of like seven, which is way, way below 13. And so we're going to be having way more protons than it needs in order for half of it to be protonated. And so we're going to see that it's almost always protonated. So we see that for the case of aspartate, well, here we have a pKa of closer to four. And so it's almost always going to be in the deprotonated state, whereas serine with a pH of pKa of 13, it's almost always going to be in the protonated state, but we can deprotonate it. And so this is what one of the things about what's so cool about enzymes is that they can actually make these things happen that you wouldn't think would be very favorable. Um, and so we're going to have this happen thanks in part too because of aspartate's norm wantingness to be in this negatively charged state where it can then form this hydrogen bond to this histidine um, kind of get attracted to that histidine and um, so pull this this proton away from this histidine which makes this one want one another one a proton more badly which is makes it willing to steal one from serine so here we're taking advantage of histidine's ability to kind of go back and forth between being protonated and deprotonated um, when I say go back and forth, like a lot more easily than it is to deprotonate a serine, you can deprotonate a histidine and protonate a histidine. You see it has a pKa of about six, which is close to the pH of our bodies. And so we have a significant amount of it in the protonated and the deprotonated states, and we can go back and forth between the two. And so we're going to go back and forth between the two because we're going to see kind of protons going all around in this reaction, starting with stealing that serine's proton. And so here, let's look at this whole mechanism again, now that we've got some of these, these terms. Um, okay, so we have this aspartate, which as we've talked about is going to be negatively charged. Now this histidine on this nitrogen is going to be partly positively charged because nitrogen is electronegative. It's going to be hogging those electrons from hydrogen, similarly to how the oxygen was, hiding, was hogging electrons from hydrogen in our water. So this is going to be attracted to this, and it's going to kind of pull it away. This is going to make this nitrogen um, more willing to attack, wanting a proton. And so it's going to be more nucleophilic. Um, remember, so we're taking some of the positivity away, um, which making this more like elect, which is making this more nucleophilic. Remember, a nucleophile is something that has more electrons than it wants. And so you've it's not drawn here, but you have a lone pair of electrons here that can come and it can pull off that proton. And now because you have already bound that, you bound your peptide in place, things are right where you want it to happen. You've active, you're activating it right when you want the reaction to happen. Well, now you get this, um, this deprotonated. Now you have this 
hydroxylate group that's going to be very, very nucleophilic, as we mentioned. And well, luckily for it, it has a very good electrophile right here. It's got this carbonyl carbon. Um, and so in the carbonyl carbon, the oxygen, this double bonded oxygen, it's got like two rings. It can kind of be pulling the electrons away from this carbon, uh, making this carbon vulnerable. You also have the nitrogen helping pull things away as well. So this, this carbonyl carbon is going to be electrophilic. And remember, a nucleophile will attack an electrophile. And so, well, that's what happens. You have this hydroxylate group attack this carbonyl carbon. You're going to get this weird, but when that attacks, now you have this awkward intermediate. And you have this awkward intermediate, this tetrahedral intermediate, where you have four things attached to this carbon. And this is going to be very awkward. And so we're going to need things to break up. But we want things to break up in the way that we want things to break up. And so what's going to happen is this oxyanion hole is going to help kind of stabilize this. And so you can see here where you have these two um, these two um, amino groups, these, these nitrogen hydrogen, basically what can happen is these hydrogens, as we talked about, and when you have a hydrogen attached to a nitrogen, it's going to be partly positive. We have this negative oxygen. This is going to stabilize this. Um, and so when it stabilizes this, now we can more easily kick off this part. Um, and so basically, yeah, so these nitrogens are coming from the bet from the peptide backbone. So in the amino acids where they have the generic amino group, this is the leftovers from those amino groups is going to be in the peptide backbone in those amide bonds. Okay, so now what's gonna happen is that the nitrogen in what was the peptide bond of this peptide, not the one in the, not the one in the protease, but the one in the peptide. Now this one is actually going to steal a proton from histidine and it's gonna bail. And so this is going to make this a better leaving group um, by taking this, this proton with it. And then this is going to allow the electrons that it was sharing with the carbon can now go back to the carbon um, and can actually be used to form a double bond to this oxygen. So now what you have is this peptide is covalently attached and it's what we, it's what we call like an acyl group. So an acyl is where you have a carbonyl carbon that's attached to a carbon containing thing on one side and something else on the other side. It could be a carbon, it could be something else. Um, and so in this case, we have this carbonyl carbon, and then we have it attached um, to this oxygen that was coming from the serine. So we're stuck on that serine. Um, and now we just need to cut things off. So we need to cut that second half off. So this is our second half of this peptide that's still stuck on this enzyme. And what happens is we're going to use water to cut it off. So we can't use the serine because, well, it's stuck on the serine, which is what we're trying to kick it off of. Um, so now we're gonna kick it off with water. Um, and so this, we're going to have something similar to happen to what happened before, where this cystidine will now, because it's nitrogen, remember, stole that proton back on its way out. So we need to steal another proton. And so this proton is going to be stolen from water. And this is going to give us a hydroxylate ion that's going to be able to serve as a nucleophile. So it's just like when we saw this it, serving as a nucleophile when it was attached to the protein um, in the serine, but now it's just free, free floating. And since it's free floating, we're not gonna get anything like stuck on um, to our protein. We're just gonna get things stuck on this part of water. Um, and so it'll just be able to like float away. So it's going to attack that carbonyl carbon. So remember like, so here you have this be really vulnerable to attack because you have this oxygen. If, even if you just had like a normal carbonyl carbon, it would be vulnerable because it has the oxygen pulling things away. But now you have an oxygen next to it too. Um, and so what's gonna happen, you have two oxygens attached to it. It's going to be very, um, have electrons pulled away from it, it's going to make it very electrophilic. So the hydroxylate ion is gonna attack the carbonyl carbon. And again, you're gonna get a weird tetrahedral intermediate. This time though, this it's gonna get split in a different way. So you're gonna kind of get this collapse of this tetrahedral intermediate where the electrons on this oxygen are going to flow back, form a double bond to this carbon, um, and this will get kicked off as a carboxylic group, a carboxylic acid. And then the serine is going to want to be protonated again, remember? And so, and we need to reset everything back to re exactly how it was when we started in order for this to be a true enzyme. Um, and so that serine, that, that hydroxylic is going to act as a base, it's going to steal that proton back from the histidine, and everything is back into how it started. And so you can see that now this isn't going to be reactive until, though, you bind another substrate that matches, brings everything into place, and you get this reaction happening again and again and again.
or at least that's what you want to happen normally. And so what happens in the case of an inhibitor is that you can actually get it so that you have the covalent intermediate be permanently stuck onto the protein. And so a common example that we use in the lab is PMSF or phenylmethyl sulfonyl fluoride. Um, so basically we get the same sort of reaction here, except what's going to happen is that that intermediate gets stuck on there. It can't get cut off. And so in the case of PMSF, you have the serine attack it, but what's going to happen is that you're not going to have a easy bond to break. Like you can't just break off this, um, you can't break this bond off with just water. Um, and so, and this active site isn't designed to, to cut this sort of bond, it's just designed to cut these peptide bonds. And so when you have it attack, you're going to get permanently stuck on there. And so this is really useful in the lab for when we're doing things like um, protein purification and we're breaking cells open and then all the pro they're going to be in contact with all these proteases and we don't want those proteases to chew up the protein. So we put protease inhibitors into our mix, um, into the buffers that we're purifying in. And we often include a lot of different protease inhibitors. PMSF is just one of them. There's also other protease inhibitors that we can use to inhibit other types of proteases. So remember we have different types of proteases. We have the cysteine and the threonine, which act kind of similar to the serine, but then we also have like aspartate, which uses water and metallopeptidases. And so we need to have different types of peptides inhibitors for these different things. Okay, but that's in the lab, but our bodies need protease inhibitors as well. And so this is where the serpents come in. So serpents are really, really cool. Unlike being like small molecules, so unlike being little like drug-like things like PMSF, these serpents are actually proteins. And they're these cool proteins that are actually going to trick the trick these proteases into binding them and then undergo this dramatic conformational change, this sort of like shape shift. So sometimes when we talk about conformational change, we're just talking about like little changes, but this is a big dramatic change. And it's such a big dramatic change that it's actually going to kind of yank the whole pro yank the whole protease along with it. So this is a pro example of this is a protease and this is a serpent. What's going to happen is that this part of the serpent is going to kind of mimic the mimic the cutting site for the protease. So the protease is going to come and it's going to try to cut it. But as soon as it cuts, does that first cut, so that's remember where it gets like stuck on there. What's going to happen is normally that would get kicked off, but instead in this case the serpent is going to like is this part that was all loopy. Well, now it turns into the sheet. And it's going to, when it does this, it's attached to that protease. So it's going to yank the protease all the way around and bend its active site out of shape. And so here you can see that it's going to be inhibited because it's not in the right conformation. The active site, those residues aren't in the right shape in order to do that second part of the reaction and kick it off. And so what happens is that the serpent is going to get permanently stuck on there, which is super duper 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 cool. Of course, if you want them to be inhibited. So why would you want that to be inhibited? because you want to prevent the unwanted cutting and chewing. Um, so serine proteases, as I mentioned in the beginning, they're really important. These like are things like trypsin and chemotrypsin um, and elastin and thrombin and plasmin. They're playing roles in digestion and clot formation and all these different things. Um, but you want to make sure that their action is restricted to like where you want to form a clot or where you want to digest food. Um, and so these serpents are able to, if you have them in the places that you don't want these, these inhibitors to be active, or if you add them once those inhibitors have done, once those um, proteases, if you have them in the places you don't want the proteases to be doing stuff, or if you the proteases have done their stuff and you now want to tell them like, okay, time to stop, um, then you can use, then the, your body can produce these serpents in order to keep them in control. So an example you might've heard about is antitrypsin, alpha-1 antitrypsin. Um, you might've heard it in like those commercials, like ask your doctor if you have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency or whatever. Basically you have immune cells um, called neutrophils. And what they do is they secrete elastase. So remember elastase is one of these serine proteases. They secrete it into sites of inflammation to help like break down connective tissues um, so that the blood cells can get in there and repair the damage. But what happens is you don't want that elastase like out other places or else it'll be chewing up all sorts of tissue. So you don't want that. So what you do is you kind of like build a moat around your other cells to keep, to limit the activity of the serp of the protease to the specific place. Um, and so this anti-1 antitrypsin gets secreted by the other cells and forms this kind of like protective moat 
And, but what can happen is that smoking can actually modify the serpent, which like breaches your moat. Um, and people can also have like anti one alpha one antitrypsin deficiencies, which is why you might hear about in those commercials, which makes them more, more vulnerable. And so in these cases of like smoking or this deficiency, what can happen is those elastase can kind of chew up too much. Um, and then you can get lung problems. Um, some other examples of serpents, uh, serpents are antithrombin, which th keeps thrombin in check during clot formation and antiplasmin, which inhibits plasmin so that clots can be disassembled. Um, and then that's just one way that these can be regulated. Um, your body also regulates the levels of these proteases by kind of making, having them. So that was one way that your body can control the action of proteases, but there are also other ways. And one of the key ways is by not activating these proteases until you want them activated. So we talked before about how kind of like binding to that specificity pocket helps activate proteases, but this is like a bigger scale. We're talking instead of like going back and forth between active and inactive, we're going from, from being inactive to being inactive permanently to being active permanently. Well, not permanently because we're switching between them, but basically these are made as inactive precursors. These things called zymogens, they have an extra bit on them. And then that extra bit can get cut off in order to activate them. So this way your cells like in your pancreas or whatever can be making these enzymes that you don't want working there. And then they can go travel to like the intestines and then get activated there. And so, for example, this is going, going to free the mature protease to do its thing. And sometimes what its thing does is to activate other protease, other zymogens to activate other proteases. So, for example, trypsinogen is the inactive um, precursor to trypsin. So this is a zymogen. It gets activated by an enteropeptidase, which is going to cut off that little inactivating part on trypsin. So now this trypsin is active, um, but you're controlling where this enteropeptidase is made. Um, so you're having this like activation take place where you want the digestion to take place. Then this trypsin, well, trypsin is able to then activate other zymogens so it can convert chemotrypsin chemotrypsinogen to chemotrypsin um, and proelastase into elastase. And so you can see that you get these pathways and then these can then be inhibited by serpents. Um, and then, the, so you have all these different ways of make sure that your proteases aren't just like chewing up everything in your body. Um, so I hope that helped you understand serine proteases and how serine is able to play a role and how it couldn't do it without the histidine and the aspartate. Um, and how this is just one example of biochemistry being really, really awesome. So hope that helps.